This is history. 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 Made up as we go along. Welcome, everyone, to History Improv, where a history expert surprises us improvisers with a historical event that we then act out on the spot. I'm Steve Fate, along with Trent Edwards. And Trent, we had another uh, pretty interesting topic that we almost didn't know what to do with. It was an out-of-the-box topic for sure. I was looking at it. I remember when I, I, I opened it up, it's like, G-g-g-g-g-g? what? <laughs> <laughs> so kudos to Randy for coming up with something so out-of-the-box. It really tested our improv framework, at least, our improv skills, and brought together two historical characters that are not usually considered in the same breath. Right. And you're talking about Randy Baker, who is a return history expert uh, to our show. Randy just retired from teaching, as a matter of fact. And we got to talk a little bit to him about his plans for retirement. And now I'm jealous, of course. Of course. And of course, what do we do? The man spends his life teaching and he's like, okay, I'm done. And we say, hey, can you just say <laughs> just a few things about this history topic? <laughs> <laughs> There's no rest for the wicked. You're going to go back to teaching right away. We're not letting you go. That's and then our improviser is also a returnee, returner, mm-hmm. uh, Shelly Friedman, who I've improved with in the past. And Your improv soulmate, I believe. My improv soulmate, yeah. So she's back for another go at this. I'm your uh, improv work husband. A long, awkward pause. <laughs> <laughs> what do I say to this? Um, <laughs> you haven't been improving around on me, have you? Well, uh, that's all right. It's fine. We're in a we're in an open improv relationship. <laughs> so find yourself a cozy hammock, grab yourself a mojito, and enjoy. Totally awesome! <laughs> all right, we're back with Shelley Friedman. Very excited to do. Another improv historical event with Shelley. She was with us for the conquest of Constantinople, and it was a a very good time. So thanks for coming back to do some more making history with us, Shelley. Thank you, Trent and Steve. I had so much fun the first time. Thank you for inviting me back. Yeah, that was great. All right. Shelley. Yes. Are you ready to make history? I am so ready to make history. Let's do it. All right. How about we check the Wayback 3000 for this episode's historic event? We have Ho Chi Minh and Thomas Jefferson. The year is 1945, and the major players, you're never going to guess. Are they? (laughs) Go ahead, go ahead. No, no, I, 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 it, it would just be a bad guess. All right. Ho Chi Minh and Thomas Jefferson. Oh, I should have said it. I I knew it. I knew that. <laughs> uh wow. I um Yeah. I don't know like what event is that? Cuz Thomas Jefferson I'm thinking of was not around in 1945. Oh, really? Yeah, I know. I this is a lot of people don't know this, but uh Thomas Jefferson he was more of a 18th century kind of guy. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, that's what we thought. That's what we thought. Right. So, you know. Is this a different Thomas Jefferson, I guess? I'm I'm guessing. I guess it was his son, Jeff, Jeff, Je- uh, Tommy Jefferson. <laughs> his son in 1945. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's a, that's a long lived clan. Um, I got an idea. What's that? Well, we'll find out. Oh, you you have a a set idea. You have all right. Hey, okay. Kudos to you, Steve. This is uh, uh, I don't know another way to say this. This is ballsy. You're you're going for it, and I'm proud of you. Mm-hmm. I second that emotion. Yeah, oh, thanks. All right. Um, we should check to see if Audrey is standing by on sound effects. There she is. All right. We open on Thomas Jefferson's bedchambers. 
Uh, Tom, Tom, wake up. I, I'm, I'm having the most beautiful dream. Do not wake me. Oh, Sally, this rainbow is beautiful. Go get me some wine. I will take as much of the wine as I can get. Yes, sir. You want wine in the morning. Okay, sure. Sally, you're so beautiful in the morning. There's no time. You gotta wake up. Oh, my God, man. Was I speaking in my sleep? I didn't say anything embarrassing, did I? Sally just went to get you some wine. Oh, well, that's not so bad. All right. Tom, we need to send you to the future. You know, man, I I can't help it. That Maybe it's just uh, my freshly woken up mind, but you sound like a ghost to me. It is true that I am from a different place, I, uh, but uh, I am very much alive. Uh, Tom? Thomas? Tommy? Yes? I have your, um, I have your wine. It's an unusual request for you in the morning. Who are you talking to in here? Oh, it's, it's Frederick, uh, of Philadelphia. He's, uh, he's woken me. Must be important news. I am not to be woken normally. Yes, I am Dr. Frederick Green, and, um, I need to take Tom with me. Uh, here's your wine. I'm going to go down and and see about uh, if Nellie has made breakfast for us yet. Uh, don't drink too much. Bye bye. Never, my dear. What is it, Frederick? You you really think I need to follow you? I'm in my dressing gown. If we need to correct things at another time, then yes, you need to come with me. All right, I'll do it if it's if it's for history's sake. I. I'm all about history and making it. We cut to the carriage house outside of Thomas Jefferson's mansion. As you see here, I've brought this uh, this vehicle for our transportation. This carriage house is rather beautiful. Yes, well, you probably think it's beautiful because, you know, you've had a couple glasses of wine. Yes, I have. It is delicious. Uh, I, one more thing to thank France for. Oh, <laughs> I love those French. So, to the business at hand. Tom? Yes? We need to send you to the future. I, I'm, I can't wait. I'm so excited. Will there be flying horses? I can't wait. This is so... I've dreamt of the future, and now I'm going to be there. Let us go! Thomas! Oh. Thomas, I... I saw you running towards the carriage house. You didn't have your breakfast. What is this car? What is this thing? What is this thing here that you're getting into? What is it? It's a vehicle. It doesn't have horses. No, it's uh, it's beautiful, though. Uh, it's, it's very hard metal and shiny. I like it. Do you want to do you want to join me? I'm, I'm going to the future. You're going to the future and you weren't going to tell me? Of course I want to go to the future with you. Here I brought breakfast muffin sandwiches for us. Oh, wonderful. Well. Oh, it's a, it's a two-seater. Ooh, this is awkward. Um. I guess I could, uh. You, you can sit, uh, in between us. Uh, this is a little, uh, cramped. Oh, we all fit. It's, it's, it's quite nice. It's cozy. Okay. Uh, let's go to the future. What time period in the future are we going to? I'll just enter in the coordinates here. No, don't touch me there. July, uh, 1st, 1945. 20th century, Sally. We're going to the 20th century. 1945, July 1st. Can you believe it? 1945? Tom, I have a feeling I know how this works. I've been reading a little bit about time travel. They're just starting to get into it. It's I, I've been reading about this in the Tackler. This is why you're my very special friend, Sally. Very special. Um, are you ready to go? I am ready. 
Uh, Sally. Uh, I think I've read about this seat. There's a seat belt. You call this a seat belt for, I've read about this in the Tatler. Look, this is how it works, Henny. You just. Oh, ah. There, it worked. Are you ready? I am ready, Doctor. Then let's go to the future. To the future, Sally. We cut ah! to <laughs> We cut to an office in Hanoi, Vietnam. Oh. Woo. So uh, beautiful. I probably should have mentioned something about the fact that we can travel not only through time, but uh, actually to a different place on, on the globe. Um, did I leave that uh, minor detail out? You did, Doctor. We didn't know we would be somewhere else. Uh... Boy, this is hot. It's hot here. Uh, what? Uh, why are we here again? I don't know yet. The Doctor told me that we needed to go to the future to correct something. Well... Obviously, this is a big uh, office because we can fit the car in here, uh, but also you know, it should indicate the importance of the person he that we are about to meet. Oh, my Lord. This office. I just realized. There's fire in the ceiling. Some sort of light, but I don't see the fire. I just see the light coming from it. How is this possible? Well, you know Ben Franklin, right? Yes, of course. You know, I've been reading about this in the Tatler, and the future... Oh, never mind. I... No, I'm listening, I'm listening. I, I want to hear about it. The Tatler is such a good read. <laughs> These are called lights. Lights, not candle lights. They're another kind of light. It's oh. like sunlight in a ball. They call, I think they're called Sunlights and Balls. Yes. Sunlights and Balls. Yes, that's what they've named them. So yes. poetic. I like it. Yes. Uh, so I, I'm just going to look around and try and find them um, if they have, I've read about indoor plumbing, and I'm going to go uh, look for some. Indoor plumbing? Wow. It's like an outhouse inside with lovely decorations. Ooh, that sounds disgusting. An outhouse inside? Ugh. Okay, I'll be right back. So, we're here to correct something in Hanoi, Vietnam. Psst, rather excited. Let's do it. You see that placard on the desk? Oh, yes. Has a name? Ho Chi Mine. Ho Chi Minh. Ho Chi Minh. Ah, interesting. That's the name. Okay, must be an oriental chap. Yes, he is from around here, and he, well, let's say he's a fan. Uh, of you, not me, not me. He, he's a fan of, of my writings, of my uh, presidential accomplishments? Yes, that's right, that's right. I, I, have, I did write those for, for history, and, and I had high hopes. This is the birth of a great nation I've been involved in. I feel like we're going to go far. And he can he can recite uh, much of your your work too. I like him already. Oh, here he comes. Honey, honey, I was walking back from the beautiful interior outhouse, and look who I found! This little man, this little man was here, and he says this is his home. Oh, here he is. His name is Ho. We just so we, he wants me to call him Ho, and this is my husband, Thomas. Hello. Ho, Thomas. Thomas Ho. I hear you're a fan. Nice to meet you. Yes, that is that is correct. I am I am quite a fan. My writing has been very uh, influenced by your work. I don't know how you got here and why you you still have your clothes from the 1800s, but I welcome you nevertheless. Thank you. Very kind of you. What's your your favorite work of mine? Uh, Declaration of Independence? That is quite fine. I probably quote that more often every day than, than any of your other work. 
Although I do like your letters to and from uh, John Adams. Yes, Johnny boy. Incorrigible chap, but, you know, he's a, he's a good man and, and he's got great principles. So I've, I've enjoyed our correspondence greatly as well. And I, I didn't actually meet your companion here. Ah, Sally, yes. Sally is a very special quadroon. She has accompanied me for years and party to many of the great deeds I have done in, in writings. She was bringing me tea and, and coffee, different things. She's a lovely lady. All right, Mr. Mr. Ho, what, wh how can I help? I, I, I feel like... Perhaps there is something of uh, great import that I have been brought to you from afar and a long time ago to correct. I assumed that the perfect person to talk to would be someone who enabled a country to cast off the yoke of their oppressors. Here in Vietnam, we are dealing with such an oppressor. I believe you may be familiar with them. For years, we have been under French control. Oh, I love those French. Such, such amazing culture and food. Ah, oh, the, the people, they, they're a huge reason for my country's existence. Uh, but you say you don't like them? They gave us banh mi sandwiches, which are good, which are good. But... Mm, we lack freedoms in other ways. Hmm. Well, uh, how shall I put this delicately? Uh, how much of your population is civilized? M m much of it. Much of it. Yes. Yes. And, uh, and are they Americans that have expanded as I expected we would? across the continent and then going west until we've reached Asia? We just got done with a war. It was a um, costly... Did the French conduct it for you? Among others. Okay. The United States was involved since your time. They have become quite powerful. Uh, of course. I predicted as much. Yay! <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Uh, I see Sally does share your enthusiasm for this fact. Power. Power. Sally loves to be around power. That's why she gravitated towards me. Well, the power you also have is in your words. I must reach out to my fellow countrymen and entreat them to join me in casting off this yoke that has been oppressing us for decades. You, you're not talking about the French still, I hope. Y yes. But did they not uh, save you from, of course, with their American allies, save you from whoever was attacking your villages? Or Well, they did help us with the Japanese, but they kind of came and didn't leave. I mean... Be honest, you must be happy that they brought their cuisine, their wines, I suppose, their literature. Fashion, their... fashion, fashion. Fashion, of course, Sally, thank you for fashion. Beautiful, lovely people and culture. But you don't like them. It, it isn't that I don't like them. Uh, is It's not worth it. Not worth it? What could be more important than those things? I don't understand. I do enjoy a baguette now and then, but I cannot get behind this uh, continuation, as it were. While our people, they're not doing as well as they could. They need, they need more fashion, like uh, some beautiful culottes. French could provide those. I know they're rude, but have you asked nicely? I... Have not tried. Okay, okay, I will follow your lead. Excuse me, I will. I'm just open this window. Uh, ma'am, ma'am. Bonjour. Can you come in here? S'il vous plaît. 
thank you for coming. And you are? Oui, uh, Mademoiselle Shirley Goudreau. Miss Goudreau. Oui. How do you see us? How do we see you? As a people. Oh, uh, very primitive, very, uh, your food is too spicy, you, uh, you, you uh, dress in, in too much color, uh, you don't wear scarves around your necks, which is very good to, for the sun, you, you don't get wrinkles on your necks when you wear scarves, you, um, ah. Uh, you need uh, more French. You need more French influence. Uh, we. Oui. That is why we are here to make you see how beautiful you can be. Your potential. Excellent speech, madam. Hello. Bonjour, madame. Parasols. I think parasols would be nice for keeping that skin oh so pale. This lady here. Who, excuse me, who brought a bag of croissant? Croissant! Oh! Here, have one for you, Mr. Ho, and you, Mr. Tom. Have a croissant. Thank you kindly. I just was at the bakery, so they're for you. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Oh, I mean, if you have to be colonized, come on, man. That's that's pretty fantastic. I'm not made of stone. <laughs> Using your case. Tom. Thomas, yes. Oh, it's it's Thomas now. I, I thought we had a thing. Yes, I I feel like if we're changing history, there should be some degree of formality. I don't think this is going as as well as I had hoped. Have you seen Dr. Green? He brought me here, in fact. I may need to speak with him privately. Okay. That is, that is fine. Go ahead. That would mean you. Okay, yes, Sally, come with me. We'll, we'll just give the, okay. the men some space. Uh, let me let me show you the, uh, Tom, the, let's go see the interior outhouse. You're not going to believe it. It's so beautiful. Let's go. Ew. Come on. Oh, all right. Dr. Green. Uh, yes. This might not have been a good idea. Oh, uh, why is that? He's into the French thing a, a, bit, a bit much. I don't I don't feel like I'm making any progress here. I I need to put something together to present to my people. And I was, you know, I was hoping that Tom could give me a little direction. Uh well, I mean, I could go back and get someone else. Maybe. I mean, he he spoke to Sean Adams. I don't I don't know if that would be appropriate, but Oh, it looks like they're coming back. Wow, I just I just got so excited. Sally showed me this indoor outhouse and it didn't smell at all. It was amazing. Those are called uh, urinal cakes. <laughs> urinal cakes? Is that French as well? Sounds like something you'd find in a bakery. Oh, those French. <laughs> they, there's nothing they can't do. They do keep things spring fresh. What flavors do they come in? You do not eat them. It it just is. Oh, I thought you just put the leftovers in the urinal. <laughs> oh, honey. My mistake. It is to create a, a pleasant aroma. Well done. Well done to the future people. Uh, I, I wonder, honey, do you think I could bring one back to the past with us? No, then doesn't that, you know, if we bring back this delicious urinal cake, then... Uh, will affect history, and you know, like uh, the, somehow it'll be like the mosquitoes won't survive because of a ripple effect that goes all through history, and then uh, you know we will have changed everything. And Mister Ho will, uh, you know, maybe he'll be a a reptile man. I don't think so. Okay, great. Well, Sally, go go get that urinal cake, and get a second one for me too, please. I have your hanky. I want to put it in a hanky. I don't. It was sitting in the bottom of this toilet. I... Oh yes, of course. See if you can get a, a couple of fresh ones, and we'll we'll nibble on them when we get home. Okay. Thank you, dear. I'll be right back. All right, Mister Ho. Uh, I feel like I am I'm disappointing you. I have one last one last idea. Have you considered sharing the French 
creme brulee with your people. Maybe that would turn it all around. I believe Dr. Green can get you back to your time and place. That one, that one was free. Don't worry. I'm sure it'll all work out. I'm back with our cakes. Let's go. Goodbye. Again, this will be a little cramped, but... All right, just squish on in there. Sally, pass me one of those cakes. I took a nibble. I don't think you'd like it. No, they aren't sweet, like our cakes. I'm much more cultured than you. I can take it. Okay, here. It's probably something savory. <laughs> take us back! Take us back, Doctor! <laughs> Cut to Thomas Jefferson's carriage house. Oh, oh. I feel like that, uh, Mr. Hoey. You know what? Maybe we were supposed to correct history by just disappointing him, because that's what we did. And maybe that's what he had, maybe some bad plan or something and, and getting rid of the French. And we've saved the, the French from any kind of bad future in Vietnam. Oh, maybe so. I, I feel like I kind of failed, but, um, you know, wouldn't be the first time. <laughs> do, you, do you know what I think made our trip a success? What's that, dear? There are no cakes. Let's put them in our outhouse, see what happens. Yeah, what's the worst that could happen, <laughs> right? Cut to Ho Chi Minh's office. Oh, mon dieu, there is a reptile man in here. Oh, my God. The end. <laughs> I thought we were going to get to uh, to meet John Adams and he would he would solve it. But we don't need to at all. That's a that's a fair, fair place to end. I bet that's almost exactly what happened. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, from what I've read about the, the start of the uh, Vietnam War, that sounds familiar. That Thomas Jefferson went into the future to try and... Um... Yeah, I think I've read that also. <laughs> all right. Thanks so much. That was really fun, Shelly. Are we all done? Can't we do a couple more? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, you guys. I hope it turns out okay, and I hope I was okay for you guys. It already turned out okay. Oh, you were. You, we really appreciate it. You did great. Thanks for joining us. And Thank you. Uh, and, uh, and you guys are wonderful. I'll, I'll be a guest on on your show anytime. And we'll be right back with our history expert, Randy Baker, after this. And we are back with Randy Baker. Randy, welcome back to History Improv. Welcome, welcome. Morning. Are you ready, Randy? As ready as I can be, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> awesome. Ho Chi Minh and Thomas Jefferson in 1945, huh? Thought you'd stump us with no historical event reference? <laughs> well, it sounded as if you pretty much knew what you guys were talking about in your uh, improv. So, yeah. I'm... Oh, wow. That That's because we have Steve, though. <laughs> 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 he led us in Back to the Future in your mystery event into a historically bad dinner date between independence icons. <laughs> Along with urinal cakes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, everyone knew that was coming, of course. <laughs> you know, it had to go there eventually. Right. Right. Yeah. So, so other than that and Steve's obvious mastery of the correlation between time travel and distance, did we get anything right in our improv set? Well, let's start with Thomas Jefferson. Absolutely. Uh, Sally uh, Hemings was, I think, what you were referencing in the uh, improv history, uh, was, of course, his black slave who he uh, went to France with, interestingly enough, and uh, where she actually asked him, actually said, I'm staying in France. And he had to coax her back to America. I'm still shocked that uh, he was able to do that. He must have been quite the smooth talker because she was a paid servant there, right? Not a slave, whereas she yep. she came with his daughter. Exactly. Right, to, to France. And uh, she's only 14. Yeah, and she uh, that's where she learned French. And uh, she saw how the French people treated black people. And, hey, I'm this is where I want to be. Hey, her and Tina Turner, right? It's uh, <laughs> a, a, lot, a lot of uh, black singers have been like, hey, this France gig is great. I am not going back. And as we will find out, Ho Chi Minh also found it France a lot better than the French colonial Vietnam. Hmm. Mm. 
yeah, that, that's quite a, an interesting, uh, him having been in his uh, colonizer's country for years, right? Well, uh, yes. He, of course, was born in, uh, then it wasn't called Vietnam, but in that region and uh, ended up, interestingly enough, in France trying to go to a French colonial type school in uh, France. And that's where he started uh, getting his communist and uh, Vietnam independence uh, ideals. So it was really interesting how he, he came to France. But that was because the French had been there really since the 17th century, trying to do what other European nations were doing around the world, and that is colonizing and taking and reaping the benefits from the resources of those places. Leaving baguettes wherever they went. I actually remember that. And uh, they, they didn't just do Vietnam. They also had Cambodia and Laos, I believe. Yep, they sure did. The uh, Cambodians and the Laotians kept the French cuisine and everything and improved it in some ways, too, I'm sure. It was so good. There was even a small part of China in what the uh, French called French Indochina at the time, too. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Uh, but roughly when was it that Ho Chi Minh was in France? Well, it really began in uh, around, uh, I want to say, 1911 or so. He was a young man, and that's when he first went to this French colonial type of uh, school. And uh, he didn't do very well there, but he ended up meeting some other Vietnamese, for lack of a better description, uh, communists who believed in independence at the time. And this really was before the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia. So this idea of communism and Marxist Leninism, but, you know, Marxists lived back in the 18th, uh, mid 19th century. So those ideals were still formulating, especially with uh, those colonies that wanted to become independent. Do you know if he had any interactions with any of the famous socialists or communists in Europe? There were some socialists that uh, later on in the 20th centuries did uh, appeal and uh, like Ho Chi Minh. But uh, early on, it was mostly uh, other Vietnamese who had already established themselves in various organizations in France that kind of allowed Ho Chi Minh to connect. His name at the time was different. I don't know if any of you knew that. It was uh, something like uh, Yuen mm Hai. -hmm. Bach, I think Bach, B-O-C. Bach, was it? Yeah. Uh, at any rate, he later changed it to Ho Chi Minh uh, long after uh, World War One. Maybe he did a side trip to Hollywood, too, and <laughs> got up there. <laughs> changed his name, right. <laughs> so he, 1911, he gets to France, and he's there until when? He becomes pretty much exiled because the French did not want him in Vietnam because he was striving for independence. So this was kind of like a 30-year hiatus where he was in exile. Mm -hmm. And he was in France off and on because sometimes he went to Britain. But by 1925, after you know, the Bolshevik Revolution and several rebellions that uh, the French had put down in uh, Vietnam, he uh, you know, really comes to the forefront of those Vietnamese uh, who were you know, striving for independence. How, how big was his stature when he left Vietnam? Did he just build and build as he was exiled? It's kind of like, hey, that guy's great. He's not here to you know, mess up in any way politically. We just kind of, his standing goes further and further up, or how did it work? Well, yeah, you know, his ascension in uh, Vietnamese politics really occurred outside the country. You know, there was no free press in Vietnam. So his name was really circulated through word of mouth because the French really controlled, uh, you know, everything in the country pretty much. And what brought Jefferson into your mind with oh, Ho Chi Minh? Well, it first began in obviously very uh, profound ways in 1945, but even back during the Treaty of Paris at Versailles after World War One. Georges Clemenceau, he was the French prime minister at the time. Of course, President Wilson, all trying to figure out what to do with Germany at the time after uh, World War I. Ho Chi Minh, uh, he was part of a group that tried to convince uh, Clemenceau and Wilson of Vietnamese independence. 
using the idea of granting civil rights to everybody. It wasn't really clear on whether or not he used any of Jefferson's words at that time. They pretty much ignored him. So you have this period between 1925 and 1945 where lots of stuff was happening. Again, continued rebellions that the French were pretty much successful in putting down in Vietnam. Wait, just before we go on, I'm just going to ask quick. Um, so with these rebellions, was Ho Chi Minh kind of like the exiled leader that's orchestrating everything from afar? Or is he just kind of a, a guiding light and he's just watching? Again, his stature within Vietnam continues to rise. There are others. Jop, uh, a very good friend of his, throughout his political career, Ho Chi Minh relied on him. And there were others. And then there was, you know, dissension among his own groups. So it was really a difficult time for Vietnam and trying to coalesce a sound group of organizations that could, you know, rise to independence. But again, he, of course, today is revered in Vietnam, has become the central figure in all of their history. And there is a lot of detail of former colleagues of his uh, from 1925 to 1945 that, you know, had various positions and created newspapers in France, by the way, which was much more uh, egalitarian, if you will, with regard to uh, other voices than the French allowed in Vietnam. So again, that period between 1925 and 1945 included efforts by Ho Chi Minh to enlist other groups around the world who were trying to gain independence for their own countries. Uh, he even tried after 1945 to, uh, was it David Ben-Gurion, of uh, before the State of Israel was created, uh, to seek his audience, which never happened. So that was where he was at. And I should also point out that during World War II, when the Japanese finally take over basically Indochina, there's a short period of time right before the Japanese surrendered in 1945 where uh, Ho Chi Minh works directly with what was then the uh, forerunner of the CIA, the OSS, to get the Japanese out. And the Americans uh, supplied them, uh, Ho Chi Minh, with military supplies and stuff to, to fight the Japanese, who eventually surrender and relinquish. And that's when Ho Chi Minh makes his famous connection to Thomas Jefferson uh, in a speech where he directly quotes the Declaration of Independence, you know, where all men are created equal and that we are given uh, certain inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. He uses those words, you know, in Vietnamese. So he invokes Jefferson again in this idea of, hey, America, you did the same thing. Why can't you recognize the same thing for Vietnam? Ah, so it was uh, like a plea to America, hey, before you uh, give this back to the French, why don't you go back to the the people who actually have been here for thousands of years kind of idea. Exactly. Is this Ho speaking for the majority of the Vietnamese people, or is this a fringe group at the time? Yeah, he's appealing for the entire Vietnamese people in his speech in 1945. What we find between 1945 and after he makes that speech, uh, drawing on Jefferson, he tries again to negotiate this independence which largely ends up unsuccessful. And then the French see their opening and say, okay, we're going to reestablish rule, and but it's going to be different in their minds than it was prior to World War II. At this time in Vietnam, the Vietnamese aren't buying it. They've got Ho Chi Minh, who is stature at this point in the world community, is uh, respected. And they feel that the French are wrong. Ho Chi Minh also uses the Atlantic Charter, which is what FDR and Churchill signed before the end of World War II, uh, blanketly saying that any country who wants self-rule should be given that right. So Ho Chi Minh uses uh, that part of the Atlantic Charter after FDR dies to try to convince President Harry Truman that, hey, look, again, not only do I have the Declaration of Independence to go by, but you guys signed the Atlantic Charter. 
let Vietnam be free and independent from the French. So why does Truman not allow that to happen? We don't know, because Truman never responded to Ho Chi Minh's plea. Let me just refer to uh, what uh, how Truman refers to the Chinese. Um, he referred to them as the Asiatics. So in America's, and I'm sure Truman's mind as well, the Asians were still looked down upon as an inferior culture. Um, uh, so to recognize Ho Chi Minh at this time, um, who was a lesser known figure than Mao Zedong in, in China, uh, and repressive, anything communist at this time, um, you know, you have, you have a continuation now of the Red Scare and especially, um, uh, with Joseph McCarthy and, what happens with, uh, uh, you know, everything here in the United States and all the sitting uh, Senate hearings with great uh, communist infiltration into the United States government. Um, there was no love lost between uh, Ho Chi Minh and the United States at this time. Ah, okay. So they're um, strange bedfellows made by politics, but also war. And it also kind of, separated even further, you know, when you have, you know, Stalin and Mao Zedong rising in communist power and the fear that, you know, they're going to take over the world with communism. And then we get this negotiated period between uh, 1945 and the early 50s, where Ho Chi Minh tries to negotiate with not only the French, but the United Nations in trying to you know, gain independence for Vietnam. And it's fraught with all sorts of what negotiations often are, uh, differences of opinion and what the way things are, are supposed to go. And eventually, uh, they can't come to an agreement. And so the French take over Vietnam again. And this is where the Viet Minh, pretty much a group that Ho Chi Minh starts uh, in North Vietnam, become prevalent in the politics and uh, the rebellions, actually, I don't know if you want to call them rebellions at this time. This is just when he begins his guerrilla warfare against the French, uh, which ultimately leads to 1954 when, at this place called the Nguyen Bien Phu, uh, where the French are sadly defeated by the Vietnamese and the Viet Minh. Really, by 1949, Ho Chi Minh starts to solicit help from the Chinese. And after that is when the United Nations, again, the negotiations start for Vietnamese independence, and they can't come to an agreement. And so this is when they divide North and South Vietnam with that 17th parallel. So you talked about the Viet Minh, um, and now where does the Viet Cong come in? How are they connected? The Viet Minh started out mostly as a political group, but eventually become the planners, and they create the Viet Cong in South Vietnam. So Viet Minh were in North Vietnam, Viet Cong were in South Vietnam, doing what the Viet Minh wanted against what will eventually become the United States. I was going to say, how did the relationship with the former American allies devolved to the point of war a few decades later, but I feel like you, you've already kind of guided us towards that just from the, the geopolitics of the time, right? It really wasn't until Lyndon Johnson that we started sending American troops over mm -hmm. to Vietnam. And that, again, was an effort to stem the communist tide. So we ended up propping up the South Vietnamese government. Even under uh, John F. Kennedy, before he was assassinated, there was support for the South Vietnamese, not so much soldiers. As a matter of fact, uh, they started under Johnson uh, putting in advisors, uh, which soon led to soldiers, American soldiers. Mm -hmm. But really, JFK was trying to figure that out before he was assassinated. Was there any hope from Ho Chi Minh's side that you know, we've worked with these guys before. We can kind of bring them around eventually. Yes, we have different political ideologies, but we are friends. We've been together in the past. Or was this doomed from the start, this relationship of 
America versus Vietnam? Well, the only time that I could find that the U.S. contacted Ho Chi Minh during the Vietnam War was after Johnson and when Nixon was elected president of the United States, where Nixon actually uh, apparently sent a letter to Ho Chi Minh saying, if, hey, can we stop this somehow? And that's essentially the spark that led to the Paris peace talks, which the Vietnamese and the U.S. were involved in and eventually led to the uh, removal of Americans from Vietnam. But that took several years. But that was kind of the impetus to get things and get the U.S. out of Vietnam because it was not working out. During the larger war, uh, what was the relationship like between uh, Ho Chi Minh and Vietnam and, and China? There was no great affection between the Vietnamese and the Chinese. And they still kind of regard each other, you know, with extreme caution when it comes to relations. But at the same time, you know, they look at each other economically. And Ho Chi Minh needed the Chinese for help during the Vietnam War. So he allowed them to uh, come in to North Vietnam, not with soldiers, but with support, while he was uh, uh, allowed to use his forces along the Ho Chi Minh Trail in Cambodia and Laos to supply South Vietnam, uh, the Viet Cong in South Vietnam. So, yeah, it's been a strained communist relationship, but today uh, Vietnam regards America and China as, you know, friends. That's interesting. They even went to war shortly after independence was gained, right? It was 19, late 1970s, China and Vietnam were at war? Yep. That's not too long after they've been helped by China. So clearly they weren't keen to, to have the Chinese as their, you know, bosom buddies. As the new French. As the <laughs> new French. <laughs> that's, that's a good point, Steve, yeah. And during the wars with France and with America, was Ho the commander-in-chief kind of model where he was also in charge of the military or was he more of the philosophical leader? But Well, he was more of a political leader. Mm -hmm. He had uh, military generals uh, working under him, of course, but even the general's greater ideals were to find a way for Vietnam to become independent. So they were all in lockstep in that regard. I want to point out that Ho dies in 1969 before the end of the Vietnam War, as we know it. They, mm -hmm. they call it the American War, mm -hmm. and uh, he died of heart failure. So it was left upon the other people around him to guide the country to independence under his ideal. So he was not, you know, in the day-to-day -day operations on the military side. He was still trying to find ways internationally, as well as to keep his own factions together on the ideal of independence. So the fact they, they did call him Uncle Ho, or they even, did. even just Uncle, so... That shows the loving relationship, I guess, you know, the adoration that the, the general people had for him. Was there any times, because this is a long period, a lot of time to mess up politically, and they're going through, you know, so many deaths from the American War, as they would call it, which makes sense, because every, otherwise, every war was the Vietnam War for them. <laughs> That's true. Mm -hmm. But um, did they not have a period or, or some point where they're like, you know, this guy, this guy's the problem. He's He was good in the beginning, but let's, you know, it's been decades. He's an old man now, and I'm not trying to uh, project here. <laughs> <laughs> let's uh, move on. Let's have a new a new leader that can uh, give some fresh ideas and, and end this war with America. Well, he does step down from his uh, role uh, before he dies, allowing others under him to take the lead. Mm -hmm. He wanted this, his old friend uh, Jop that I mentioned earlier to take on the role. But instead, the Politburo, as it was called at the time, elected this other individual who ended up guiding Vietnam after Ho stepped down. But even though he stepped down, he still met with these leaders regularly. So he was still influential even after he stepped down. Okay. So... Uh... Of course, you have to draw the parallels. Uncle Ho, Uncle Sam, do, do they have novelty T-shirts in Vietnam now on their Independence Day <laughs> where they have Uncle Ho, the top hat or something from France, maybe? just to I don't know <laughs> about any uh, 
no t-shirts or any bling whatsoever. Randy, we bring you on this podcast for your expertise and you don't even know novelty shirts? I know, I know. What is that? <laughs> What's going on? I did. Interesting. You should check it out. Uh, the uh, Vietnamese Tourism Bureau, both uh, Ho Chi Minh City and Hanoi. I want to go there after watching those videos. I mean, oh, it's it, a beautiful country. You know, they've got history there. They've got, you know, colonialism and they're espousing all of this as draws to get tourists to come. But one thing I do want to point out, it's not a T-shirt, but it just shows the reverence that the people of Vietnam have for Ho. And his uh, will, he wanted to be cremated, but they didn't do that. They did what they did uh, for Lenin, and they embalmed his body, in that, which is now viewable in a mausoleum. So maybe there's some kind of you know, souvenir you can get when you go to the mausoleum, but I don't know. Mini wax figure. Yeah, mini wax. <laughs> well, they've got <laughs> statues of him at various places, you know. Yeah. And it, even as a world leader, he was respected. He's their saintly figure that will never um, exactly decompose. That's well. Maybe he'll get his wish and be cremated, but that remains to be seen. Who would have been the better figure for Ho Chi Minh to bring back through a time machine? Would have been Thomas Jefferson or Franklin Roosevelt? I, as far as I know, he never referenced uh, FDR. Now, I think Jefferson is is the guy. He's definitely the guy. It's pretty clear that Jefferson penned those words. Yeah, I mean, that's the, that's the good reference right there. But, but Ho had to know that Jefferson was joking when he wrote <laughs> that. The guy had 600 slaves in his lifetime or enslaved 600 people in his lifetime. Like... Go figure. He clearly doesn't mean all, mean all men are created equal. All white property owning men are created equal. <laughs> this has been the challenge, teaching challenge of my life, trying to explain to students how, what Jefferson meant when he himself owned over 600 slaves and how could he deal with that hypocrisy. Yes, exactly. All right. Thanks so much for all your insights. Appreciate the topic as well. That was a really interesting topic. Like, and it, out of the box topic, I would say. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, this is a an, another example of one of those moments in time that there's so much background, so much context oh, yeah. to, to explore that it it really is an interesting subject. Yeah, we could spend another couple of hours talking about the specifics more, but uh... but thanks so much. It's been a treat. Yeah, thank you guys. And that was History improv a very interesting topic and exploration. Yeah, Trent, I was thinking that we, this was going to be the first episode where the, the expert said, hey, I'm done. I don't need to say anything because you guys got everything right and I, I have nothing to say. I have nothing to add. I don't know what happened. Class dismissed? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I feel dismissed. <laughs> It's just like real life. That's nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that was uh, that was a lot of fun with Randy. I, I gotta say, everybody take a drink. I just said that was a lot of fun. Everyone take a drink. It can be lemonade if you uh, do not imbibe in the alcoholic beverages. Ho hopefully, in your hammock, you uh, you have somebody coming to uh, refresh your drink. Or you don't have to get up out of the hammock. I know that can be a struggle sometimes. Here in these dog days of summer, you don't want to be getting out of the hammock for any reason except survival if that maybe you don't want to get up <laughs> bury me at wounded hammock <laughs> <laughs> with randy we were talking a lot about different aspects you know leading up to it up to 1945 with ho chi minh kind of harkens back to an episode that we did earlier uh about the paris commune and I couldn't help but think about that when he was talking about Ho Chi Minh going to France and there being a communist ideology firmly entrenched there already. Mm -hmm. And we knew that 40 years or so earlier. So it didn't just come out of nowhere with him going to France. It was there. And we could uh, draw a correlation to a previous episode. For sure. And it's interesting. France is the birthplace in a lot of ways of modern socialism. Mm. That was when they're working out a lot of it. 
was uh, around that time of the Paris Commune. And well, everything, you go back to the French Revolution, but then that I thought it was interesting that he was saying, oh yeah, they were treated with kid gloves effectively when they were in France. It's kind of like, oh no, you, you can't slap, you can't slap the boy when he's in public. You have to do that behind closed <laughs> doors. The, the behind closed doors is Vietnam. And then France is the, uh, the church or the open street where you cannot treat the the kids like that kind of thing. So yeah. France was, you know, the the colonizers with a bit of a schism in their in their thinking. So listener, we will be going on a bit of a hiatus, but we will be back. Yes, we will. And we have a solid backlist of episodes now. You could find that hammock again, chill out, listen to some historical events and some improv for some lighthearted summer fun indeed and also look at those show notes and yes <laughs> like we like like the show notes for this episode yes episode eight yeah so we got pl there's plenty to read up on if if you plow through all those episodes and much more to take in our podcast i believe is a gateway drug for history and the show notes are the the next step after listening you can go check it out and the links will take you to all sorts of interesting new historical information. Indeed. So tell us where your favorite hammock is. Email us at hello at historyimprov.com. And so a few things we'd love to hear back from you about. What have you liked so far about History Improv episodes? What segments do you enjoy most and why? What segments do you enjoy least and why? How do you feel about the length of the episodes? What about Steve is annoying? Please, don't pull any punches here. How much more do you want to hear Trent? Please, don't stop with the compliments. Oh. Does that sound right? Right? <laughs> no, be kind. Please be kind. Steve is a wonderful man. I, I'm, a, I'm a sensitive man. I'm a, I'm a very sensitive man. So if you're going to get personal, at least do so with childish profanity. Um, mm -hmm. Gosh darn it, just pile it on. Yeah. Don't be a dunghead. Just go for it. To find out more about us, check out our website, historyimproved.com. It's spelled historyimproved.com. Yes. Please share, like, and subscribe. And while you're at it, rate us highly and leave a hot, uh, leave a, a, a multi-star review, like up to five. How about just go with five stars? <laughs> Sounds good. I was wondering where you're going with it. Leave a hot. A hot review. Woo. Oh, yeah. Do that, too. <laughs> Absolutely. Keep it uh, family rated for uh, if you're writing anything, because you don't want a steamy review. I mean, I kind of do. I'm joking. Definitely send me the steam. Steamy. Oh, see that. That's that's more. That's kind of more creepy. Like. Yes, I was a very popular ladies' man in college. Hey, 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 hey. Want to go for a coffee, 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 coffee. Oh, and Trent, I'm going to do the same thing you did to me last time. Give me a don't forget. And don't forget to check out the historical landmark that you've really been scared to go to. For me, that would be Stone Mountain on the way home from North Carolina. Yeah, let's see if we can let's see if we can do this. Cruise that head back, enjoy another history improv episode. I should redo that. Trent, I I I think we I'm very sad story. You you keep bringing the room down here. I don't know what's going on. It's just just imagine being my like real wife. No, this is close enough. <laughs> Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.